Hi, everyone. This is Josh Nelson at Keystone Financial Services. Hey, just checking in with you today on a couple of different items. Uh, today, we're, we're going to be uh, actually sharing two different events coming up. Uh, number one, this Thursday evening, for those of you who are in town, we're going to be having our halftime event. I'll be doing a webinar version of it as well this next month. But keep in mind that the live event is going to be at the House Neighborly Services on Thursday evening. So we like to do it at local businesses, not only because it gives us an opportunity to go someplace new, but also to support a local business or a local charity. House Neighborly Services is a great organization locally and is able to provide things from uh, anywhere from clothing to uh, counseling for people that need help with job training, uh, substance abuse, all kinds of stuff. So please uh, come out to support us for that and also to learn about the market and the economy and where we are so far for 2019. I can see several people are signed in already. I've got myself a webcam right now, so hopefully you can, uh, can see me, see the slides. And certainly one of the items that I would recommend that you, you would do is that you would keep in mind that these are recorded presentations. And oftentimes, in fact, most of our clients, when they attend one of these, there's actually a multiple of that of people that watch the recorded version after the fact, not only because people just can't make it at the live version of it, but also because they've got spouses and kids and friends and coworkers, all kinds of people that would find the information useful. So uh, certainly let us know if you want us to send it out to you directly. Otherwise, you can go directly to our YouTube channel. We'll have that up there later on today. Uh, social media is a great resource for us. Uh, we have we know that there are a lot of different people that use Facebook. We know people that don't. We know people use Twitter, LinkedIn. We want to be able to speak all those languages from a communication standpoint. So please keep in mind we have social media channels. Uh, we're going to be looking into, into Instagram later on this year. I know uh, for younger people that tends to be a better resource for them. So hopefully we'll have that up and running soon. So with that being said, I do want to point out that we have a couple of different tools here in GoToWebinar. One of those is the questions box. I can see a couple of things have come through there already, so I know it works. That's good. Also, the chat box. If there's something that you'd want to uh, point out to me or ask a question, you can use either one of those. I've got them up uh, on my screen here as far as a dashboard. And I'll keep an eye on those along the way. Depending on time, I know for some people that are attending live, they need to scoot and get on after the lunch hour or whatever they're doing for the day. So we do want to definitely honor the time. I never go more than an hour or sometimes even shorter than that. But I do want to always leave room for questions at the end, especially this topic. Today, I, I saw in the news, the financial news, that Capital One, they think that the over 100 million people had their information hacked from Capital One. If you had your credit card through them or some other kind of account through them, how frustrating would that be? And I would guess if we took a poll, we're not going to, but I would guess that there's enough of us on the call today that we all have been impacted one way or the other by an organization that has gotten their information hacked, or maybe we're a direct victim of identity theft where somebody's impersonated us or actually stolen information, false charges on credit cards. I've had several of these things happen myself, and I consider myself a, a fairly careful person as far as protecting my information. So with that being said, I'm going to hit my webcam off here and get started. One thing I do want to point out again is the questions and chat features. You can actually expand those boxes inside your GoToWebinar toolbar. So feel free to communicate with me along the way. I do have everybody on mute uh, just to make it easy for everybody to concentrate and go about their day but certainly use those communication tools. The identity theft topic is one that we've given several times over the years, and I can tell you that I, I tend to have different stories and updates every time I do it simply because things have changed so much. Uh, different organizations have been impacted, and uh, and certainly identity thieves get, uh, I don't want to say smarter, right? They're uh, uh, but you know, maybe they're they're uh, more clever, right? As far as their ability to get our information and do bad stuff with them. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about a couple of different things related to what identity theft is today, and then we're really going to get into the meat of the presentation, which is so what do we do about it, right? I think that's why everybody is here today. You probably had other things that you could have done over your lunch hour than just listen to me talk. You're probably looking for some practical information on how you can protect yourself and protect your family. So certainly pass this information on, pass this presentation on to anybody that you know, that you care about, that uh, should be doing this for themselves and watching out for their own 
information. I'm Josh Nelson. I'm the founder and CEO of Keystone Financial. We are a comprehensive financial planning firm, meaning that we're not like a lot of people who call themselves a financial advisor. Really, all they're doing is giving investment advice, and they're not doing a comprehensive look at people's entire financial situation. That's what we specialize in. That's what a certified financial planner, which I am, a CFP, that's what a certified financial planner is trained to do, is really be able to address not just the investments, but also the more complex, inter- interesting uh, areas in the financial planning world, which would be Social Security and Medicare and cash flow planning. Uh, identity theft certainly plays into that because it's about protecting what we've accumulated, right? So definitely an area that I'm trying to hone in on and make sure that clients are aware, at least when they're going about their day and their life and traveling all over the world, what they should be doing to protect themselves. There's our disclosures, and we'll get right into the presentation. So what is identity theft? It could be a lot of different things, right? Uh, but more or less, somebody's impersonating you. Basically, somebody has your information, and they're doing stuff that they shouldn't be doing with it. Uh, clearly, in most cases, people are financially motivated, right? They're trying to impersonate you so they can either take out a loan, get a credit card, open an account. Uh, for them to be able to get identification on their own. That happens sometimes where somebody will actually use somebody else's information to impersonate them and get a legit ID that has your picture, your information, and they're able to go out and do stuff, again, usually financially motivated. But ultimately, they're pretending to be you. They're really pretending to be you and using that information for their own gain. Unfortunately, just like any kind of a crime, it can cause a lot of damage and not only cause damage to your finances, but also to your reputation, right? I, I think that's the most frustrating part is actually the reputation part of it because financially, a lot of the finances can be fixed and a lot of organizations, credit cards and so forth have obligations that you're limited to a certain amount of liability. But what about the time? That's the one thing none of us can get back. We can't get our time back. And it's very difficult to repair your reputation. In some cases, as we talk about it, it may not even just be on your credit uh, card. It could also be on your uh, on your, your record. Uh, people have had that happen where they've actually found they had a criminal record because somebody impersonated them and it, it caused problems for them. And uh, certainly not only financially, but also from the reputation. So a few facts. One thing to keep in mind is that this is actually one of the fastest growing crimes in America now. And the good news is that violent crime uh, actually globally, but especially in the U.S., violent crime has actually uh, been dropping. But cyber crime, which I would call identity theft cyber crime because a lot of it is done using technology, is one of the fastest growing crimes. The number of identity theft incidents reached $7 million dollars or $7 million a year, according to the FTC. And of course, that number is going up exponentially year over year. Uh, I think, again, because the identity thieves are getting more clever and where they may have uh, you know, resorted to other types of crimes in the past, there's always a percentage of society that is going to be looking to take advantage of other people. That's just a sad fact that we've got that and that we need to know that because we need to protect ourselves and, and not be ignorant of the fact that there are people out there actively trying to do bad stuff with our information if we let them. Every two seconds, a person falls victim to identity theft. I believe that. And over 140 million hours were spent by identity theft victims trying to resolve their issues. And as I mentioned before, it may not even just be a financial issue. It could be trying to repair your information or your uh, your reputation. Studies have shown that seniors and children are at the highest risk. Of course, when you think about that, who doesn't apply for loans all the time? Well, a lot of times seniors don't and kids don't, right? And and so it's much easier to be able to take their information and get away with it for a while simply because people may not be actively checking their credit reports or applying for loans where that stuff would pop up and cause problems for them. So uh, impacted seniors, people 60 and older, the percentages go down as far as seniors that are applying for loans actively, and so they may not know it for years in some cases. And then 66% of respondents uh, say that identity theft, uh, that they experience fear regarding their personal financial security. I think that's a good thing. I, I think that's a healthy fear because there are people out there 
as we saw with the Capital One thing today, there are people out there that are trying to get our information and do bad stuff with them. So most cases of identity theft can be resolved if they are caught early. It does get more difficult, certainly, if time goes on, but not impossible. There are companies now that specialize in identity theft repair, and some of you I know already sign up for things like LifeLock. Those services can be useful uh, because they, they actually have a resolution service as part of what you're paying for. So it's almost like an insurance policy in some cases where they would actually help you and and spend the time, which in a lot of cases, that's our scarcest commodity, again, of uh, time and being able to go out there when we already have a family and a career and everything. Uh, it's tough to go out there and spend a lot of time doing something else that we weren't planning on. It takes most victims of identity theft three months to find out, again, much higher when it's kids or seniors. And only 35% of identity theft cases involve credit or financial fraud. Sometimes it's just your phone. Uh, utilities uh, it could be employment fraud, somebody using your information to apply for a job or giving information that's false that would be related to something that they're, uh, something else that they're applying for, but be using your information. So how do identity thieves get it? Get it? Uh, actually, most of it's low tech. Identity theft experts now say that the majority, even though we're living in this increasingly high tech world and we have uh, certainly a, a lot more information flowing around. Still, most identity theft is happening with low-tech means. Dumpster diving, that literally would be going through your trash looking for personal information. There actually are cases where somebody even has a shredder and they shred their financial statements. But the shredder, because it wasn't a cross-cut shredder, that would be a recommendation I'll throw out to you is to get a cross-cut shredder, meaning that it, it actually cuts two ways. Much, much more difficult to be able to piece that together versus a one-way cut. Basically, it puts it into strips. Many cases of uh, even they've, they found meth heads and people that are being paid to put together these strips of paper back into statements so people can use it. So, you know, certainly use a crosscut shredder or, uh, or I, I just saw a comment come through. Uh, some people burn it. Of course, that's even better probably um, so that you know it's gone, but certainly use it in a way that that information is going to be pretty indecipherable from your paper statements. Of course, also using electronic statements can help with that as well. Most organizations now allow you to do that, meaning that you wouldn't have that paper laying around for a low-tech thief to get access to it. So, of course, stealing your mail, stealing your wallet or purse, that's been going on for decades, of course. People could have done that a long time ago. Stealing debit and credit cards through skimming all I'll kind of touch on that for a second. What skimming is, for those of you who aren't familiar, is that there actually are these little skimmers that are a very small device that you can scan a credit card with. It takes the information off the magnetic strip on the credit card. So oftentimes where people would find themselves victims of that would be ATMs. In some cases, ATMs, if an identity thief could go up and they actually would kind of attach something onto the ATM or even a, a gas station scanner, it would make it look like you're putting your card into a legit scanner to be able to buy something or to be able to get cash out of an ATM, when in reality, it's actually scanning your information and they get access to it. Uh, so that's one way. The other way, uh, sadly, is that they say in a lot of cases, it's happening from servers at restaurants in that you hand over your credit card when you go to a restaurant and they walk off with it, right? Well, in, in some cases, those people have a skimmer in their pocket and before they scan the credit card to be able to pay your bill, they scan it real quick into their skimmer and it takes your information and now they've got it to be able to use someplace else. So keep an eye on, on that, certainly on where you're providing your credit card to. Uh, phishing scams, that means companies or individuals are calling companies pretending to be somebody and trying to get little pieces of information. So that's one thing that, uh, you know, hopefully organizations are, they have procedures in place. We certainly do here at Keystone, but they've got procedures in place that would keep people from getting bits and pieces of information that they could compile and come up with a comprehensive a kind of package of information on you, in other words, that they would be able to call another company then and be able to get all kinds of information or even be able to conduct transactions. So uh, keep an eye on, on that, certainly. 
and to do whatever you can to be able to protect your information. That's oftentimes the way people are getting them. Uh, obtaining your credit report, certainly lots of information on their uh, business records. And then, of course, diverting mail to another location. And in some cases, people will actually change your address. They'll actually change your address on a legitimate account and have things sent someplace else. Or they'll open an account in your name and have things sent to another address, addressed to you, but it's going to another address. So you never get the statements, say, on a credit card or some type of a loan. And so you figure it out. So what do they do with it? Of course, uh, they could take your money out. They could take money out of your accounts, your bank accounts in particular, uh, through electronic transfers, could even be going into the bank, counterfeit checks. Uh, very easy. We had an identity theft expert come in a couple of years ago, actually, from the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department. And he said that's one thing that uh, he recommended. And of course, he's paranoid, right? As he should be, because that's his job. He, he's a specialist in this area. But he said he never writes personal checks anymore. And the reason why is that it's so easy to be able to go out and order, right? We get these in the mail all the time to be able to go order cheap checks from some outside third party vendor. Well, if somebody, let's say you wrote a personal check to somebody, if you look at the bottom of your check, now they've got your routing number your checking account number and your name, your address, all that information's on the check. Very easily, they could go out, order new checks and just change the address, right? Just change the address. And now they could be out there starting to write checks off of your checking account and you wouldn't even know about it, right? And unless you're keeping an eye on your checking account. So uh, certainly keep an eye on that. You might even heed his advice and write less personal checks and use other means to pay for stuff. Uh, so opening bank accounts in your name, writing bad checks, of course, opening credit cards, and of course, they would never make payments on it, and you wouldn't know it for a while. Uh, using your name if they get arrested, your contact information, and of course, using your name or information for purchases used in the, like, illegal activities, which you can imagine what that is. Uh, using your name to file for bankruptcy. This has actually happened. Using your name to file for bankruptcy or avoid debts, obtaining a driver's license, uh, or other kinds of legal documents, uh, certainly you know, passports, anything like that, that would be horrible if your information was used that way. Uh, this could be even buying a car or some other type of purchase using your information, your credit history, or again, to obtain services in your name. It could even be things like utilities, cell phone, things like that that they could be signing up for and you are the one possibly paying the bill or it's just going to do a bad debt. A collection that you wouldn't know about until you start getting phone calls or you apply for a loan or you start getting notices in the mail uh, suddenly that you owe somebody money. So identifying identity theft, how do you watch for this stuff? Because so far we've just talked about the scary stuff in how does this actually happen? How do they get the information? But here are the things to watch out for. I wish I could tell you, by the way, that that there's a way to avoid identity theft. But I think we're all, we've all been around long enough to know that there really is no way. Uh, if the IRS can get hacked, if Equifax, which is a credit reporting agency, if they can get hacked, when that's their mission statement, basically is protecting our information, we know that anybody can get hacked. So oftentimes this is also a, uh, a wake-up call that this isn't just about preventing identity theft, but recognizing that it's likely to happen to us eventually and to be watching out for it. Because as I mentioned, it's much easier to correct if it's caught early versus if it's allowed to go on for weeks or months or years. Much more difficult to get things repaired. So warning signs, uh, if you're denied credit, of course, if, if you go apply for a loan and you know that you've got a good reputation, good credit, and you get denied for a loan or a credit card offer, I would not take that at face value. I would definitely dig into that and find out why, because it's possible that they saw something on your credit report. More often the case now, where I used to be a loan officer actually in college, that was one of my first financial jobs. And we actually manually pulled people's credit reports and, and went through their credit report and checked their pay stub. We did it all manually back then. 
Well, now a lot of companies don't do that. They they actually will do computerized underwriting, meaning that there's really not a human that looks at your stuff. If you apply for a credit card, it basically just goes through a computer and the computer spits out a result. Of course, if you have bad stuff on your credit report, it may spit out that bad result. So if you ever get denied for something, or even if, let's say you applied for a credit card and you asked for a certain limit, and then they said, well, we're not going to approve that. We'll approve it for a lower limit. I would ask the questions. I I would find out why. Why was it that I didn't get what it was that I asked for? Uh, If you find unusual charges in your credit card statement, I know looking through credit card statements and checking account history is not the most exciting thing to do, but definitely keep an eye on it and at least scan over it. If you're not the type of person that likes to look at every single transaction, I get it. We're all busy, but at least take a scan through it. Make sure that there's no weird dollar amounts or weird company names that don't make sense or even locations. Oftentimes it'll say that on the credit card statement where the location was. So be watching for that. Uh, Certainly with credit card companies, most now will actually replace 100% of any losses. They won't charge you anything, but there's a legal requirement that you are only liable for the first $50 now. But that being said, if you don't figure it out for three years, that's a lot more difficult to go back and get it fixed, right? And versus my experience has been, and I've had this happen a couple different times over the last few years, when I've called my credit card company, I've explained what happened, they're very quick and they take the charges off and it's a pain in the butt, of course, because you've got to get your credit card sent out, but they're very responsive. They FedEx them out. You've got them overnight. It's just that you've got to go through and of course, any automatic payments, you've got to go fix them all. So it's a pain in the butt, of course, but usually the the credit card companies are very good because of course, they want to make sure that they're very responsive and that they're not liable for any future charges that would come through. So they want you to contact them as soon as possible. Uh, suspicion that your mailing address has been fraudulently changed. Again, if there's irregular weird stuff coming through your mail, your email, certainly look into it. Uh, if you stopped receiving certain stuff, if you're used to getting credit card bills through the mail and you haven't seen them for a while, check into it. Now, it could be that your credit card company, uh, you know, somehow you opted into electronic statements and so you don't get them by paper anymore. That happens a lot, but certainly be watching for weirdness when it comes to your mail or even your email. If you start stop getting emails, if you haven't seen an email for a while with your credit card statement, find out why, because it could have been diverted someplace else. Uh, certainly your credit report, and we'll talk about that more here in a bit as far as credit reports, but if there's anything weird on there, of course, look into it. Don't just assume that it's okay. And then of course, and uh, you know, I, I hope none of us have had this, but if you receive a call from a debt collector about a debt you don't owe, uh, of course, that's a big warning sign that there's something weird going on. And of course, those are not pleasant calls. I've gotten those before and it was, wasn't was even me. It was, uh, they were calling about somebody else, but it, they can get really nasty debt collectors. Uh, so definitely ask them for the information though, if you're on the phone and they, they're they basically accusing you of something or saying you owe money, make sure that you ask for the specific information and the contact information so you can start to track it down. That'll be helpful if you need to contact a credit reporting agency or another company. So the credit report, annualcreditreport.com. Every year, you've got the ability to get a free credit report. And believe it or not, you're actually eligible to receive three free credit reports because there are three main credit reporting agencies. Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. Again, Equifax, maybe not the best reputation right now because they they had a big hack of people's information. I think for their credit, at least, they did provide some uh, some remedy and uh, you know some identity theft protection for a period of time. But nonetheless, they they failed at their mission statement clearly. So there are those three credit reporting agencies that you can certainly get a credit report from each. So if you think about it, really every few months, every four months, you could get a new credit report just choosing it from a different agency. And not only would you make sure that you're kind of crossing, you know, going across the different credit reporting agencies, because they don't all necessarily report the same way, but also it helps you stay up on it. And you know that it'll never be more than a few months until you've seen a new credit report. So annualcreditreport.com, be careful. I wouldn't just Google this, go to this specific website, because if you Google free credit report, 
you'll get all kinds of websites of people that want to provide credit reports. And of course, some of those might not even be legitimate. You might be uh, unwittingly giving your information to an identity thief. Wouldn't that be ironic? A uh, question came up in the queue. Uh, it says, being our financial advisor, can you get your customers' credit reports, uh, credit scores on a regular basis, uh, annually? So I can't get that for you directly. Uh, we don't have that right now, but that I'll jot that down because that could be a service we would add in the future. Uh, it could be reported through our technology as well. But the next best thing would be to go to the annualcreditreport.com and then every few months check with each one of those. So what to do, because it's going to happen. I hate to say it, but it is going to happen to you sooner or later uh, because that's just the world that we live in. So the first thing is that if your identity is stolen, to file a report with your local police department. So uh, they'll kind of direct you on what those next steps are. But depending on what it is that, that you find out, if you found out that, hey, you know, there's some guy and he's got my information, he applied for this loan, you actually can just call the police and file a report so they can start looking into it, especially in cases where it's low tech crime, which oftentimes is the case. They will, uh, will be the point of contact, certainly, especially if it's something local where they, they would be going after a waitress or something like that, right? Hate to say it, but they may have had a string of victims, right, that are all reporting this. That way they're able to start to hone in on who it actually is that's doing that. Uh, number two, close your accounts. Of course, if you go to your bank or your credit union and say this happened, that's the first thing they're going to tell you to do, even though, again, it's a pain in the butt, whether it's a checking account or a credit card, it is going to be a pain. There's no question there's going to be some brain damage with, with getting things updated and uh, figuring out what charges have gone through and haven't gone through and contacting various companies with your automatic payment information for new accounts. So there is going to be some pain involved in this. Even if you didn't lose any money or even if the financial losses were little, uh, you definitely would want to close your accounts. You don't want to leave that open because clearly somebody's got your information out there. And oftentimes what will happen, they say, is that that identity thieves, if they get credit card information, for example, is they'll put through some small charges just to see if it works. And then they'll actually go on to something else, something larger. So you definitely would want to close things quickly. Again, banks and credit unions are very good at this typically because they don't want to be liable for anything more. Uh, you know, they, they also want to help their customer. Clearly, if they're a good company, they're wanting to serve you better, but they're also trying to protect themselves because there may be some liability on their end for any false charges to your account. Uh, initiate a fraud report, um, certainly. So through the credit agencies, Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax, I would put that alert out there with all of them. If it were to happen that, hey, I had a loan taken out in my name that was false or uh, you know, there were medical charges that were put onto my credit report. Sometimes it's not even an identity theft thing. And this is this has happened for a long time. I used to see this as a loan officer that people would apply for a loan and they would actually, there was one time where somebody had some medical uh, charges that showed up on their credit report that was charged off. It, it looked like it was something that hadn't been paid. And the person actually found out, this was the son I was dealing with, he found out that it was actually his dad, that they shared the same name. And the way that their credit reporting agency reported it is that it actually went under the son's name instead of the dad's name. And so it was keeping the son from actually applying for credit. So that was a, a legitimate thing that the son really had no idea about it. And it wasn't his charges, yet it was still information that was false and needed to be corrected. So that was one thing that he was able to do right away was to be able to put that fraud alert on his credit report just so everybody would know that would show up that, hey, this was not legitimate and it's being fixed. And the credit reporting agencies will help with that. And then, of course, fix the specific problems. This is not one to blow off. If you are actually are a victim, uh, you, you want to be game on on this. And certainly, if you have LifeLock or some other service, they are providing that as part of their package, typically, that they're resolving, that they're helping you resolve it. So certainly, use those resources. Don't try to do it all on your own because they may have other ways of doing stuff, uh, other ways of contact, numbers, things like that, that would actually ease your pain, or they might actually do some of the work for you. 
So fixing specific problems, let's look at a few examples of what could happen or what most commonly happens. Let's say that somebody's tampered with your accounts. So somebody's hacked your accounts and they've got your information. Of course, you'd want to close the accounts immediately, uh, get new passwords, change PIN numbers. Those are all things that are good to do anyway. Of course, be careful about where you're keeping your passwords and your PIN numbers. That stuff is oftentimes easily hacked, especially if you're keeping it all in one place. That could be scary if that one place got hacked. So be careful about where you're keeping your credentials, your information. If you want to contact the credit reporting agencies, uh, creditors, merchants, which basically would be the bank or the utility company or wherever it is that has gotten compromised. Uh, stolen checks or credit cards. Again, the stolen checks might not even be your physical checkbook getting stolen, but as our Jefferson County speaker mentioned, they actually could just take the information from a check that you wrote them, right? You may have written a check or, or maybe a, a check got stolen out of the mail. They get that information and now they're ordering checks in your name. So that would still be a stolen check, certainly stolen information. So put stop payments on anything that's not legit. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, any checks that are outstanding, you'd have to put stop payments on those. Contact all the places that you owe money and let them know what happened. It's going to be some work, certainly. Uh, but taking the time, investing the time up front will definitely help make the, the pain less and certainly help prevent anything worse from happening down the road. Uh, contacts, again, it, it would just depend on who it is. It could be your bank, your credit card company. It could be the police. So, you know, certainly take the time to get all the resources contacted and they'll direct you from there. And then certainly on the credit report, if there's inquiries on there, and some people don't realize this, that when you apply for credit or anybody applies for credit in your name, that there's actually a credit inquiry that shows up on your credit report. So they'll show a list of that. And if you go out there, you guys could do it today, right? You could get your credit report. You'll see a list. And if you see something on there that's not something you did, then that's a red flag. That's a red flag that maybe somebody else is doing that and applying for credit in your name. And it could be one of those where they've got a credit card that they've gotten issued by getting your information. Uh, one question that came up in the queue here is, will slides be available? Absolutely. So this is being recorded and it'll be on our YouTube channel as well. Uh, we'll get that recording posted today. And if anybody wants me to send them the individual recording, I can do that directly. I can email that out to you. So just email me at josh at keystonefinancial.com. Just say, hey, Josh, uh, when the presentation is done, can you send me a copy? And I'll certainly do that. So a lot of this stuff is a little bit uh, information intensive, right? I'm throwing a lot at you very, very quickly. And then, of course, if there's inaccurate information on your credit report, which uh, does happen, especially if it's been compromised, and sometimes even when there's just not correct information, the credit reporting agencies are not infallible. Sometimes information gets garbled up, like my example with the father and son, where neither one of them meant to do anything wrong. Even the dad didn't mean to get it in the son's name. It's just because the names were the same. The credit reporting agency somehow confused the records. Stolen social security number. Uh, but, you know, they, these days, the good news is that most companies don't use the social security number for identification anymore right? They're not going to just ask for that and then they give somebody access to all your stuff anymore. So social security numbers are a lot more available, unfortunately, just the, the flow of information is such that it's not that hard to get access to that. In fact, I can't remember the guy's name, but he's actually the, the founder of LifeLock, uh, famously has put his social security number out there online, basically just saying, hey, you know, if I use LifeLock and I feel so confident that I'm going to put my social out there. Uh, you won't find me doing that, <laughs> but but he did do that. So certainly get a copy of your social security statement. Make sure the information is correct, which you should be doing anyway, right? Make sure that the earnings history that they've got in your social security statement is accurate and it somehow hasn't gotten confused with another person, but then report that to social security and that way they've got notification of that, especially if somebody were trying to get a copy of your social security card or something like that. Uh, stolen mail, falsified change of address forms, local post office, so U.S. Postal Service, uh, certainly banks, credit card companies, 
and then only change your address in writing. One thing to, to keep in mind is that it's, uh, it's one of those things that they can do it over a recorded line, but that's one thing that you might want to, to think about is just changing your address in writing. So you've got a record of it and they've got a record of it. Lost passport, that's a Department of State. Of course, some of the stuff is harder to replace, right? Uh, like a birth certificate or a passport. But certainly, you'd want to make sure that if you lost your passport, you report that right away. There's all kinds of stuff that people could do with that. And to try to impersonate you going out of the country, doing illegal things, anything like that, you'd want to make sure that the State Department's aware of that and they can take whatever measures they need to get that replaced. Of course, uh, for you personally, you may need it anyway so you can travel, but uh, certainly you don't want that just floating around out there unchecked. And then fraudulent activity on your investment or brokerage account. So sometimes people ask that. I haven't seen it in the queue yet, but sometimes people ask that. Well, Josh, how do I know my money is safe with you guys, right? And so the good news is that although, again, I, I'm not going to sit here and say that that your investment accounts are hack-proof, we're, we're all smart enough to know that there's nothing that's hack proof anymore. The good news, though, is that investment accounts are a little bit different than bank accounts in that you've got two things. Number one, it's a third party. So you've got a custodian like Fidelity, for example, that is holding on to the assets and we're a third party being named as investment advisor. So you've got some separation there. But these are also a little bit different than bank accounts is that they typically don't have checks issued on them. They typically don't have debit cards issued on them. So it means that if somebody is going to get money out of the account, they typically have to either put pen to paper or do a DocuSign where there's a number of different security questions asked. And then the other benefit, of course, is that you've got us, right? And we know you. We've got a small enough client, a number of clients that we know our clients, right? And we know if uh, we're getting alerts, and notifications, things like that, we would know pretty quickly if, if there was money taken out of an account and it wasn't something where you asked us to do it, in other words. We also don't take any instructions over voicemail or email, so we will make sure that we actually are listening to you, uh, you know, by your voice. And of course, for any newer employees, they're instructed that they need to take further uh, further measures, you know, have, make sure that the client talks to somebody that knows them or that we need to identify more information before we release funds or something like that. So at the end of the day, um, you know, we are a fiduciary. We're here to be your advocate, right? So that is our job is to make sure that we're doing whatever we can to help protect you. The other benefit is that investment accounts actually have insurance on them. Fidelity, TD Ameritrade, all these companies have insurance on the accounts that help protect in the case of fraud. Uh, debt collector contacts you. Again, we talked about that before. Of course, you'd want to contact that debt collector. If somebody leaves you a, a voicemail, you know, you could call them back, certainly. The one thing to be careful about, though, and I'm sure some of you have gotten this, I've gotten several of these voicemails where somebody uh, leaves a message pretending to be the Social Security Administration or pretending to be the IRS and saying that, uh, you know, you owe us money and if you don't pay it back within a certain amount of time, you probably have heard of some of these if they're not legitimate. So if you were to call them back, be really, really careful that you don't give them any of your personal identifiable information. So what I would do is if the IRS left a voicemail for me and I thought it was legitimate and they left a number, I wouldn't call that number back. I would contact, I would go to their website, go to the IRS's website, get their direct phone number and contact them back and say, did you contact me? That would be the way to do that as opposed to just a voicemail left on your cell phone. Uh, of course, if you're wrongfully, wrongfully accused of a crime, I would hope that you would do whatever you could uh, do to clear your name, but uh, certainly you'd want to contact a defense attorney. Uh, you certainly want to contact uh, you know, local authorities and to let them know, you know, this is not me, clearly, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, certainly do whatever you need to do there. And then uh, if you, if somebody filed bankruptcy in your name, uh, certainly write to the U.S. trustee, that's who's in charge of the bankruptcy process. And then it could be that you're actually contacting the U.S. attorney and or the FBI as well. So those would be federal crimes, certainly at that level. So fixing your credit report, again, the, fact, the faster that you take action, the less liable you actually are. 
here's some things to be thinking about to help prevent this stuff. We know that there's no way to be foolproof, but what can you do that would just be common sense stuff, right, to avoid? So putting your, your passwords on your bank credit card and phone accounts, you have to do this, right? We all have to get access to our stuff online, but don't use passwords that can be easily guessed. Usually they'll have things that they require you to do that make the passwords more complex, uh, but certainly don't use things that would be obvious like dates of birth or your kids' dates of birth or your pet names, things like that. Got to make the passwords more complex, certainly. Uh, some people will actually use sentences, especially if they don't limit the number of characters that you can do. Some people will make a really long sentence of, you know, some, uh, you know, kind of gobbledygook of words and things that they know. And of course, you say, well, how in the world am I going to remember that, right? Where am I going to store these passwords? So uh, one thing to keep in mind is that iPhone, I know, and I think Google has the same sort of thing, but they actually have a password locker in the phone. So I've talked to a few IT experts that have said that that's actually a good way to do it because they're actually separated out and encrypted. Uh, there are other clients that have used uh, OnePass and other services that will create really long, indecipherable passwords that you would never remember, but you actually would keep them on a USB or a token. So there are other ways to do that. Whatever you decide to do and you find what's right for you, just make sure that you're not doing things that are, are obvious or certainly keeping all the passwords in one place that are easily hacked, uh, like spreadsheets or something like that, that uh, that would be something that somebody could just get into without a whole lot of effort. Uh, don't carry your social security card on you. Uh, keep it someplace else. Uh, certainly a safe deposit box or a fireproof safe would be a better option. So don't do that. Don't use it as your password. Don't use it as your username unless you have to. Uh, do order a copy of your credit report at least annually. And again, we found that every four months you actually could do this, right? So you could get four a year. And of course, you could get more than that, right? If you're willing to pay for them, then the credit bureaus start to charge you after that point. It's not that much, though. So if you wanted to order one once a month, you certainly could. One thing, and I know the question came up before, is can we provide you with an updated credit score or credit report? And I'm not here to, to give a commercial for LifeLock. I'm just telling you that I use them personally and I have no financial incentive if you sign up, anything like that. I'm just telling you that what I get personally is that they do send me an email. Seems like it's once every month or two that says your credit report has been updated, your credit score has been updated, and I'm actually able to log into LifeLock. I know there are other services out there that could do the same thing. So uh, do the research, certainly, and think about investing in that. It's really not that expensive. It is an expense, but it's not that expensive. To me, it's like buying insurance. I, I look at it that way. It's like buying identity theft insurance because I know that if something bad happened, I would be able to, to find out about it pretty quickly. You can set all kinds of alerts and things like that inside the program. Pay to, uh, close attention to your billing cycles. Make sure that your bills are arriving on time, of course. Uh, checking with your creditors if you're not getting the emails or the the, uh, the mail that you normally do. There is some advantage, you know, to keeping things simple. And in that case, you know, ha not having 10 credit cards and eight of them are just kind of floating out there and you don't even have cards for them anymore at department stores. Yeah, of course, it's nice to get some money off by getting a Kohl's card or something like that. But consider how often you're doing that, how often you're going out and getting cards that you really don't use very often because those are kind of prime targets for identity thieves is for dormant accounts where you're not really using them and they somewhat how to be able to get your information and start using them before you even have a chance to identify them. Guarding your mailbox from theft, uh, certainly you could get a collection box, you could get a PO box. Um, don't leave your mail in your mailbox. I know in our neighborhood that we're kind of an old school neighborhood, so we actually have a normal real mailbox, but in a lot of neighborhoods now they have the locking mailboxes, so that does help a bit, but certainly don't let that pile up. In some cases, actually people are wanting to do more of their stuff electronically because they see that as safer than having it in the actual mail. 
uh, don't give me out your don't give out your personal information. Uh, the IRS will not call you unsolicited and ask for a bunch of information. And if they do, you have every right to not give it right and, until you're able to completely vet that entity and make sure that that's who they say they are. What I would do again if I got a call from somebody saying they were with the IRS is I would get all their information and I would uh, say. Uh, you know, I'm going to contact you back and I would go to the IRS website and contact them directly with their 800 number on the site. And that would be the best way to figure out if it was legitimate or not. So, of course, a lot of that, especially debt collectors, they can appear scary and intimidating over the phone. Just be very careful about what information you give out. One thing you might think about, too, is for your parents. In a lot of cases, our clients, their parents are elderly and because we talked about before, kids and seniors are more vulnerable. Oftentimes, because seniors are more trusting, they will release information, especially if somebody is trying to intimidate them and, and make it sound like they're in trouble. They're with the police or they're with the IRS or something like that, or they're with a credit bureau. They could easily give out information. We've seen it happen. We have seen it happen, unfortunately, with our clients, with family members where they've actually lost money even because of identity theft, because somebody pretended to be a legit organization and even money got wired. You know, there there were situations where people just didn't, they didn't realize that they were being scammed. And then farming scams, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that identity thieves oftentimes will create a website or make themselves appear legitimate. This can happen in the email form. I can tell you that I get these from time to time where it looks like it's coming from Microsoft or Outlook or something like that, when in reality it's not. And luckily, you know, it's not that I'm always the the sharpest crayon in the box, but you know, if you if it doesn't pass the smell test, I call my IT guy and say, is this legitimate? And I don't open anything, don't open any attachments, don't open any emails that you're not sure are legitimate. And certainly don't go to any links because that can put all kinds of stuff on your computer. And in some cases, people can actually get your your information that way. Now, of course, we talked about before that most identity theft actually is done in a, a low-tech way still. And I would even consider those skimmers kind of the low-tech way of getting people's information because those things are pretty cheap. They can get them pretty cheap. Uh, online and, and ship to them. And it's basically it's taking your physical credit card, scanning it real quick, handing it back. It's really sad that that happens, but it does happen a lot. And it's not something that you're always going to be able to prevent necessarily. I know some clients that actually have told me that they will not allow a waiter or waitress to walk away with their card anymore. And they'll actually walk with them over to the the register, which you know, I, I know may not always be comfortable, but if you really wanted to assure that somebody couldn't do that, walk with them. I was just in Europe. In Europe, they don't actually ever take the card. They walk up to you with their handheld device, and you can see them actually scan the card. So you, you see if they can actually walk off with it. And some companies like Chili's, I know the restaurants actually have that right at the the um, you know the table now. Red Robin, I noticed as well. So you might choose different places. If you're not able to actually see them scan the card, you might choose different restaurants based off of them. So I know I've just given you a mouthful. I do have some sources here of, of stuff. Uh, LifeLock is a great resource, even if you don't sign up with them. They actually have a lot of good free resources out there on identity theft. So I would recommend them, as well as the three credit reporting agencies, Experian, TransUnion and Equifax. So those are the three, again, lots of free videos, uh, free information out there that will help you protect yourself that really will expand on a lot of the topics that I've covered today. So if you want to dig deeper, of course, certainly use me as a resource. So you've got my email address and my phone number. And, uh, you know, certainly I, I hope that you're never a, a victim of identity theft. If you're not, you will be one of the few. So that's not to say that we should be running around paranoid all the time and uh, you know not living life, but I think it is important that we're all cognizant and we're all street smart enough to know that some of these things are happening. And there are certainly people out there that will take advantage of us if we let them. We certainly don't want to make it easy. So even if we are victims, we definitely don't want it to be because we did something that, that made it easy for them to do that.
And again, we, we included a lot of stuff in here in the presentation as far as ways to be able to fix it, to be able to address these issues quickly if need be. So with that, I'm going to actually open it up for uh, any questions that we've got. Again, a couple came in here and certainly be typing those in the questions box or the chat box if you've got anything. Uh, so one question that came up before, and I'll just readdress, will slides be available? And the truth is yes. We always record our webinars. And because we record the webinars, it gives you a resource to be able to go back to, even if it's you not watching the presentation. Maybe it's somebody that you know. Actually, I'll turn on my webcam here so we can see each other. Uh, so that, that's always on our YouTube channel. We keep them there for a long time. So you're able to pass on those links directly to anybody that you care about that would want to know this information. So keep that in mind, certainly, that we've got all those archived. If you've got recommendations for these webinars, by the way, I always like to hear them. This actually is a culmination of a number of people saying, hey, when are you going to do identity theft again? And so that's why we're talking about it today. So I definitely take those recommendations. On average, we do about one of these per month. Next month, as I mentioned, we're doing a halftime presentation, which will be an overview of topics that relate to where we've been so far for the year and kind of doing a midpoint check-in on what's happened, where we are, and where we may be going through the remainder of the year before the Forecast 2020 presentation that'll be coming up. So certainly a lot of hot topics right now, a lot of volatility still in the market. It's been good recently. Volatility goes both ways, right? So that helps. But it's been a good year to, uh, to be able to reassess portfolio risk and reassess where people are comfortable as they go forward. So uh, let's see what else we've got. Uh, lots of good comments here from Mark. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, one point uh, was on social media is as far as what kind of concerns should we have about social media and how much information we're sharing. That's a really, really good point. I'm glad you brought that up, Mark. If you go out there and, and look at what information you're sharing, you want to be careful about what kinds of details you're giving. Although you, you might be wanting to share stuff with colleagues or friends, you unwittingly put, could be giving that information to identity thieves that could be basically phishing, right? Using your social media to fish for information and start compiling an, an, an information profile on you to be able to use against you in the future. So be careful about what level of information that you're sharing out there and, of course, who, who you're accepting for friend requests out there. Uh, obviously, some people take it to the extreme and they say, you know what, I don't need to be on social media. It's not for me. Uh, I'm not going to lose any sleep if I'm not on there. And that's fine. That's why I mentioned before, we want to be there and be able to speak uh, speak Facebook, speak Twitter, speak LinkedIn. If those are the things that you're on, we certainly want to accommodate that and communicate with you that way. But of course, we're never going to get away from things like this, from our webinars, communicating by email. We don't send much snail mail anymore just because that's not, I think, real productive. Most people don't even look at it anymore. So most of our communication comes by stuff like this, either live events or by email. So any other questions that you've got, let me take a peek through. Uh, again, slides will be available. It usually is later on today that we're able to post it onto the YouTube channel. It takes GoToWebinar a little bit to process everything. Yeah, and again, the social media thing came up again. What, you know, what about Facebook or Twitter? So just be careful. Be careful about what you're sharing, how much details that you're sharing. If you're putting it out there, you probably should assume, and I should too, right? You probably should assume that you know everybody's going to see it, even maybe not your friends. There's going to be friends of friends that could see it, or maybe somebody passes on the information. So be careful there. Somebody else mentioned uh, just that this is a hot topic uh, that his uh, his wife got hacked and uh, you know it was about email. That's a good point actually because we've had that happen in a number of cases where I've gotten emails from clients that are weird, you know, and and I think that they're weird when I see them. And then not that long after that, then the client from their real email address they'll send something saying, "Hey everybody, my email got hacked." You know, don't don't act on emails from any other email address that the, that than this one. Also, a good reason why to make sure that if you have any old email addresses, make sure that those are still protected and nobody is using those, right? So I know we've, we've been talking about a bunch of stuff and a bunch of reasons to be paranoid here, but it's just a, a real eye opener, I think, for all of us, myself included, a good reminder to protect 
our information. One final thing I'll mention before we pop off here is estate planning. Sometimes uh, identity thieves actually will go after deceased people and use their information to, to try to apply for credit. So, of course, be watching that if you've got a deceased spouse or parent or something like that. Be watching that for their information that uh, that is not being used somehow or you know elderly people we talked about before. So watch out for that. Also, when you're thinking about your own estate planning, think about your own personal information and how your family will get access to it. Right? We've been talking about how to protect people from your information information, but how do you let people into your information if something happens to you, say if you're incapacitated or if you've passed away, do people have access to your your stuff? Do people have access to your computer, passwords, things that they would need to be able to get into your accounts and start getting information? What about your estate documents? What about other types of documentation on property? So be thinking about what works for you. And certainly I can visit with you about that, about what other clients have done. But think about if you have a fireproof safe or a lockbox or a safe deposit box in the bank, do people know that, you know, the people that you care about, right? A very tight circle you want to keep this on, but do they know how to get access to those things or how would they do them? Sometimes clients use us actually as that resource where they'll basically tell their, their kids or their spouse, hey, if anything happens, contact Keystone, contact Josh. They know where everything is. I've spent the time to make sure that they know where they need to go, who they need to contact. So we're certainly... Uh, you know, respectfully, we'll take that role if you'd like us to be able to keep that information and be able to communicate in that way. I'd say the majority of our clients, that is what they tell their their loved ones, is that we kind of know the whole picture. We're a comprehensive planner, so we know the whole plan and where everything is. So with that being said, um, I know we're kind of coming up to the end of the hour. I'll check questions real quick. Um, yeah, I think that's it. So if there's anything else that comes up, certainly let the, let us know if you're a victim of identity theft. We're not identity theft experts, but certainly let us know because we we want to know, of course, to be able to help protect your information on our end. But also, we can be a resource. We know a lot of people, and we can at least point you in the right direction. So certainly, let us know if anything happens, so we can act and do whatever we can to be able to help you and help you guide through that process. So with that being said, um, again, be watching now. We've got our halftime presentation coming up this next month. For those of you who are here local, we'll be doing that on Thursday evening. As always, uh, we're just a phone call away or an email away. Josh at KeystoneFinancial.com. Our team loves working with you and your families, so please let us know if there's anything that we can do to serve you better. Take care and enjoy your week.